Total Screen proudly presents the Weekly Set Podcast with Tyson Gifford and William Rorick. Episode 246, recorded March 16, 2020. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Set, the official podcast of the Total Screen. I am your host. My name is Tyson, and joining me today, as always, is my partner in crime here at the Total Screen, and uh, coronavirus-free, I might add, William <laughs> Rorig. We are the coronavirus-free podcast, so you yeah. can listen with confidence. We will not infect you over the uh, over your iPod or your yeah <laughs> o- over over the, uh, the the tubes and pipes of the internet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I I was on vacation last week. Hell of a time to be on vacation <laughs> as the world kind of came to a screeching halt. But yeah, so we're back now. And as we had said when we left off on our last podcast, that we'd be returning to talk about season two of Lost, and that is why. Why we are here to talk about season two of Lost as part of our Lost rewatch. So, yeah, Lost season two. Will, you already told me it before we started the podcast, not your favorite, and that this reconfirmed it for you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's no secret. I've mentioned it before that this was not my favorite season. And, yeah, I, my thoughts on it are, you know, it just seemed it seemed a bit directionless. You know, where I thought season one did a good job of setting up the basic concept of the series, introducing us to the characters, teasing at some of the deeper mysteries. This, I don't know what they were doing with this season because there, it does, it, it, it doesn't, you know, we're already introduced to the characters pretty much. So, like, there's not that. I mean, we already know the premise. So what they needed to do in Season 2 was explore those mysteries deeper, and it seemed like they were afraid to do that, and they kind of pulled back from that, which is weird. And I'm just like, and it just made for, like, kind of a boring season that seemed, like, directionless, and it kind of comes across as, like, they didn't, they weren't really sure where where they wanted to go with it. See, there was a lot I really liked in this season, but there was also, as you said, there's a lot of stuff that feels kind of directionless or, you know, a lot of, a lot of parts that feel like a little loose. Yeah. Yeah. But then there were other things I really liked. Oh, like, yeah. I really like all the Dharma Initiative stuff. Well, yeah, obviously that goes into the deeper mysteries of the island. That is yeah. good. We need more of that. <laughs> I, I like the aesthetic of it. I like, I yes. like the whole kind of like seventies, eighties, aesthetic to everything yes i love like it. pneumatic tubes and stuff like that like i love that <laughs> i love that it's like found ancient you know temples except instead of ancient temples they're like 70s like concrete bunkers with pneumatic tubes and and you know videotape playbacks and eight millimeter film you know <laughs> it's like that whole aesthetic is is really pleasing to me it was one of the things i i liked most about lost through its run that just that whole aesthetic of it yeah i mean that's good uh i mean yeah it's not to say that season two doesn't have its good parts obviously yes the introduce introduction of the dharma initiative it's a lot of introductions though some of the best characters too some of the best character introductions we got yeah it's desmond desmond henry in quotation marks i'll say (laughs) because i don't think they've revealed his real name yet on the show no oh no they haven't so i'll just say henry i was gonna blurt it out so (laughs) until i remembered many people listening probably don't know uh it's he's not henry (laughs) yeah we we know that much already that's been confirmed we just they haven't said who he is yet but he was introduced um calvin was introduced that's the guy that was played um that's the guy that was played by um clancy brown oh okay yeah so we got it got him and saeed's story and then we got him and desmond's story yo Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's the uh, he's the army guy who eventually yeah. ends up as part of the Dharma Initiative and finds Desmond. Yes. So we got we got him. We got um, besides Desmond, we got Penny and Widmore as well. Now here's the deal, though, because it's a, they introduced good characters, but I can't give them points for Desmond because they do nothing with Desmond in the season. Desmond well, becomes they, the last episode. The uh, last episode is. Yeah, he shows it's a up two-part the... Desmond episode, and yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's great. It's great. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, but literally, like, having Desmond episode as, like, the finale of season doesn't give the season points. 
because Desmond really comes Well, he's into, in, like, the first episode and then the last and, like, yeah. brief bits He between. really comes into his own in later seasons. Yeah. I'm not giving season two points for that. But, hey, uh, what about <laughs> the Desmond introduction? The scene, like, everybody was wondering what was in the hatch. And then season yes. two opens with this montage that's already been imitated by The Good Place. It was imitated by uh, um, uh, Westworld. Like, this this scene with, Here, with here's, Desmond here's working what out. I, here's what I wanted to tell you. Here's what I wanted to tell you. I will say, for its part, season two starts out strong. We we find yep. out what's in the hatch. We find out Desmond's been living in the hatch. That's really interesting, right? We find out about the tail section survivors. We get more info on them. That's really interesting. It's just from that point, after like a certain point, it just meanders. For, yeah. yeah, like if it if it was like a thirteen episode season, it would be fantastic. Right, exactly. If, it, <laughs> if they condensed it, it's down. still good. Like the thing is, like Lost is so good that even when we talk about the disappointments, it's still good TV. You know, but they it's had just to, not they, as good. They had to do weird <laughs> shit, like uh, Kate seeing seeing a horse from one of her flashbacks in the island and f- having a freak out for the entire freaking episode. And yeah. it's like, and 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 they do this with multiple characters throughout the season for no and it's Char- annoying charlie's heel turn yeah charlie's <laughs> heel turn his freak out episode then they give hurley a freak out episode and it just becomes it's it's like okay it's obvious that this is filler you, you know yeah. yeah we we know what you're trying to do trying to fill out 24 episodes like i said yeah <laughs> it should have been tighter uh also i i felt like I didn't really care for any of the uh, tail section survivors except for Mr. Echo. I think I think Echo is like one of the most fascinating characters that they had on the show. He's uh, good, but I also like Bernard and Rose, man. That's Bernard a sweet and Rose, story. Are, yeah, that's a sweet story. But they're more minor characters. They're very yeah, definitely. Yes, say you you can't hate on them, but they're minor characters. So they but their but their episode was so sweet. Yeah, so the, the episode was not. Yeah, that was a good episode. Their episode yeah. was so sweet. But yeah, they 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 show up rarely uh, throughout the series. But it was yeah. nice to see them get reunited because that was a lingering plot line from the first season. So it was nice to get get a good resolution to that. Also, um, though, it doesn't seem like anything now, and it se- seems like weird to make it sound like progressive <laughs> when this was like in 2005, 2006 or whatever, but um, nobody thought Bernard was a white guy. No, nobody was expecting that. Yeah, and, and them doing that and never like making a big deal of it. Like it was a, it was like a, oh wow, like, oh, it's just this old white guy, you know? But then never making a deal about it, never like drawing attention beyond the fact that that's what it is. Right. I think was kind of new for like TV. Like, you know, like it played on expectations. People had expectations of what Bernard was going to be, you know? Yeah, yeah. People did and have And that wasn't it. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't it. Yeah, like, like, yeah, they love to play with expectations like that. Yeah. Most annoying new character of, of the season goes to Anna Lucia. <laughs> yeah, she. That's what I was, I was tweeting about on during her episodes was just straight up talking about how she's just recklessly aggressive. Yeah, she's just recklessly aggressive, always has an attitude, never like thinks straight. Like, yeah. like, and she gets like two episodes and then she's and dead. She, she even said in, in one of her, one of the episodes she was in, she even said like, I think she said it to, to Henry in quotation marks that she doesn't like that she learns from her mistakes and doesn't make the same mistake again but like that's her making the same mistake again is why uh you know it's why she's dead is why Claire's dead you know (laughs) like Claire not Claire um uh, (laughs) Shannon it's why Shannon's dead right exactly it's why Shannon's dead because she made the same mistake again it's also why she's dead it's because yeah literally she gives because because literally because she's butthurt because you know, Henry tried to kill her, you know, and it's like, well, what do you expect, uh, you know, a man who is your enemy to try and do? But, like, she she could have been, like, she could have been, like, he's locked up, you know, so it doesn't, you know, doesn't matter. But she she had to, like, she had to, like, untie him and everything so that she could just gun him, you know, basically let him loose so that she could just kill him in cold blood like she did that guy from her flashbacks. Because mm-hmm. apparently, like... Apparently, like, her thing is, like, if, if somebody, like, wronged her, like, brutally, like, like that, then she has to let them free so that, and then kill them in cold blood. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, okay, one time, sure, but like the second time, I was like, why, why is she doing this? And, you know, and then she doesn't follow through, and then she gives the gun to Michael to let him do it, and then that, that results in her, Michael killing her, and I'm just like, you know, I know nobody was expecting Michael to do that, but it's kind of your fault that you ended up dead. Because if you didn't yeah. have the gun, if you weren't trying to kill Henry in the first place, you wouldn't have given that gun to Michael. Yeah, she needs a little humility. She like, yeah. <laughs> she jumps in, take, forces herself into a leadership position, acts like like everybody else is being stupid but her and then continues to make the same boneheaded mistakes over and over again at the cost of other people's lives and eventually her own. Right, yeah, you exactly. Know? Her boneheaded move caused the death of the guy from the tail section of the plane that she thought was another but wasn't. It caused the death of Shannon. Caused it caused, of- you know, yeah, yeah. and then eventually led to her own death and as a byproduct Libby's. Yeah, and as a byproduct Libby's, exactly. So she got like three people and herself killed by her boneheaded decisions. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's like Anna Lucia. Like that's that's always been kind of my thought. Is like she's like a bad character, and like that's not necessarily meaning that she's that they couldn't have done something interesting with her. It's just that she's. Part of me can't help but feel like the fact that they killed her off so soon probably, like, cements that. Like, maybe if she survived into, like, season three or something and she was, like, more developed and we got, and we got, like, a sense of her, like, dealing with her, like, issues and maybe, like, evolving and learning, mm-hmm. then she might have been, like, a better character over time. But the writers really didn't give that a chance to happen. So yeah, well, part of that yeah. is I think <laughs> I think a lot of the Taylor section people um, turned out to be to, to have some problems, right? Like the actors, I mean, not well, the characters. Oh, really? So some drama. <laughs> yeah, there were a scenes. lot of DUIs. Oh boy, <laughs> on that on in Hawaii related to the Taylor people. It was some of the regular st- cast too, but it was a an like an absurd amount of their ones. I think the actress who played Libby um, and. Lucia and Echo all got DUIs. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah. What were they doing? Like they were they were like did they have like the the DUI club or something? <laughs> I don't know, but they they like they all got DUIs. I think I think one or two other people from the main cast did, but having such a concentration in such a small group from the tail section is just weird. Yeah, it I, is. I remember when that was happening. It was such a weird thing and and so a lot of them got killed off prematurely like earlier than you'd think yeah because of that yeah because i wasn't expecting Anna lucia to die at the end of season two when i first watched the show that was yeah, like such a shocking problematic scene. on the set yeah so yeah there, there's it's interesting how lost had to face certain issues like that like and not just like behavior issues from actors but also like you know the the walt storyline is one that's criticized in the run of the show that they didn't address the walt storyline enough and it's because the actor was in puberty and he was growing too quickly yeah <laughs> yeah but it's a shame because they, they set up this whole idea that walt's psychic and you know he he knows things or you know or there's something off with walt and then it's never followed through and it's just well, it's like, cause like by the time they're recording season three he was basically like came across like an adult <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work any, like the actor. It just wouldn't have worked anymore. Right. Well, that's what happens when you have like child actors. You, you got to plan around that. Sorry. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, that's Lost, why, Lost you know, had, some of its biggest issues Lost had were related to things like that. Like they were planning issues because a lot of the people on that show weren't necessarily a, that experienced, you know, like Damon Lindelof wasn't an, an experienced showrunner, you know? Right. This is new. And so they were doing a lot of new ideas and doing a lot of cool stuff. But like at the same time, they were making a lot of like follies that a more experienced showrunner might not have right. because they they weren't experienced. And you I, know? Th- and I so think season like two that. is really where some of those follies uh, really uh, are really noticeable. Yeah, you can you can see that, and and it's also it's um like, I've like used the, this expression when we've talked about like, like Agents of Shield in the first yeah, season, but yeah, like they were I, treading water. Yeah, they're treading water. Like, there's a lot of good ideas. Obviously, I mean, it's still lost. It's still a great show. Yeah. There's still there's still a lot of good ideas that come up in season two. It's just you can see like it's it's not handled in the best way. 
I think my favorite parts of the season are, like, the beginning of the season and then, like, towards the end of the season. You know, after, like, yeah. uh, the, af- after Henry is introduced, it picks up. Cause then you get yeah. that, then you get that intrigue, you know, with yeah, him. Yeah, Michael Emerson is such a good actor. Yeah, Michael Emerson is such a great actor. And it's so weird cause, like, it was weird watching him in person of interest after Lost. Right. Cause it's such a different because, character. Cause he's such this, like, nice, good character. And then, but but then I got used to that character, so now going back to him and Lost, it's, like, weird again. Although, although at <laughs> first, like, with Person of Interest, it was still, like, it, I was still thinking, like, you know, like, he was such a good character, but I was also thinking, but yeah, but he's still mysterious. We still don't know a yeah. lot about this guy. <laughs> he's mysterious, but he's not, like, sinister. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Henry is creepy as fuck and Lost. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. <laughs> like, when he'd, he'd set Jack and Locke up to a fight and then listen to him fight and he'd, you'd just see him smiling. Yeah, you just see him smiling. <laughs> like, he's smiling as manipulation is working. Yeah. Uh, man. So, what else are we going to talk about with season two here? I don't know. Uh, I guess, like, the Charlie going crazy. Like, like he, he gets the idea that... He, Charlie's heel turn, basically. Like, he gets, the, he has this weird dream. This is, this is a running theme in season two. Like, people have, like, weird dreams and then they, they wake up and instead of saying, oh, well, that was a bizarre dream, they, like, freak out and start thinking it's real life. I don't know. Um, yeah. There's a context, like, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't watched the rest of the show, but there's a certain context to things that happen later in the show. Yeah. That when you apply to the things like the dreams, the apparition, the things that communicate to these people and set them on their quest has a completely different tone now. Right, right. I mean, you kind of you know what that means now. You know what that comes from. Yeah, you know what that comes from. But like, if you're thinking rationally from like a character perspective, like especially like somebody, there's no reason for them to start believing like dreams are omens. Like Locke, it works for Locke because Locke, like, it works for Locke and it works for Echo because yeah, those are the men of faith. Because those are the men of faith, especially Locke because he had like a legitimate miracle happened to him uh you know but like charlie d- didn't have like anything amazing happen to him to have like yeah. any faith in like any supernatural forces uh so it's it's just weird but yeah but he has a dream about claire's baby uh being in trouble and so he goes crazy for the entire episode trying to steal claire's baby and yeah. baptize and baptize him because uh echo says something to charlie about baptism like yeah yeah echo says like charlie needs to baptize the baby you know and uh yeah, and, and Charlie's like trying to drown the freaking thing. And, <laughs> and, it, and it, yeah, and he's just being an asshole. And eventually, eventually they all confront Charlie as, because he steals the baby in the middle of the night and runs the baby over to the freaking ocean. And everybody's like, you know, like, like, you know, like Claire's like, oh my god, my baby's gone. And they find Charlie, like everybody's just horrified. And Charlie's standing there. And then Locke, very rightfully, I would say, like cold clocks Charlie a few times and, and takes the baby back. And this leads to Charlie developing a grudge against Locke. And, you know, that, that's Charlie's big heel turn because like an episode or two later, Sawyer does this con where he's plotting to use the everybody's fear of the others to basic to basically take control of the guns. Yeah. And he plots this with Charlie because he has Charlie basically like basically like put a bag over Sun's head and drag her like a few feet and then drop her. You know, just 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 to scare her and to make make her think somebody tried to grab her and to make people think that the others were coming after them. Yeah. And you know, like when this is when this is revealed at the end of the episode that that the whole kidnapping thing was uh, was a uh, Sawyer and Charlie. Like Charlie basically, you know, reveals that he did it to get back at Locke. You know, yeah, he wanted to make Locke look like a fool. Yeah, he wanted to make Locke look like a fool. You know, and it's like, and in and, and spoilers for season three, but like even now I'm watching season three and Charlie is talking to Locke and Charlie is still like complaining to Locke that he hates him because like Locke punched his face and like you kidnapped a. Fu- 
fucking baby. What part of that do you not understand? Like, like, does not get through your thick skull. You deserve to be punched for kidnapping a baby. You yeah. know, for freaking Claire, the fuck out, the, the woman you supposedly love so much and you scared her to death. Like, yeah. how does that not register? It <laughs> unlocks the bad guy. I remember, here's the thing though, it's like, by the end of season three, Charlie feels completely redeemed. Right. So we know that's coming. It's just a matter of of this heel turn that's in season two is so kind of annoying. It is annoying. It is it's one of the most annoying storylines of the season. But there's Cause there it, are a few it, of those, like you mentioned. You like, know, yeah, like like I said, it's a few of those. It's one of those castaway, like they they see something in you know in a dream or something or in the forest, and they go crazy for the entire episode. And yeah, with Charlie, they just took it an extra step further to where like he just becomes an asshole for no reason. And it's yeah. Like, yeah. They did it, they did it a little bit with Sawyer too, but in a different way. They didn't give him a deluge or anything. They just basically challenged his growth. Yeah. And then, and then made him like kind of backstep on it. They made him backstep on it, which I was more fine with because it's, it's a more Sawyer thing, you know? Yeah. It's more in character. It's more in character. Then you had, you know, another one you had was a lot kind of like losing and regaining faith, like on an episode by episode basis. Yes, yes. It was <laughs> actually, you know, actually I didn't have a problem with that because that was one of the big themes of season two also was ring thieves was like they were challenging Locke's faith. And, and so you had this theme, like I, I really feel like. I understand what they were going for with the introduction of Echo and tying Echo so closely to Locke because they had this interesting, they had this interesting dynamic now where, where Locke, where Echo was a man of faith and Locke was losing his faith and then Echo eventually takes on Locke's faith himself. And that sets uh, and that that sets Echo and Locke at odds because Locke had totally lost faith, and Echo is carrying it on. And it's kind of mm-hmm. weird, but it's it's kind of interesting at the same time. I think the general idea of it is interesting. I think the way they played it out um, with Locke kind of wish washing a little bit on his faith when they were doing it was a little off. Right. Like, I think the hard turn he eventually made was interesting. I don't think that the wish-washing before that was. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. The wish-washing before that was kind of off, but the hard turn he made, like, when he, when he sees, like, when they find, like, uh, the pearl station mm-hmm. and and they and Locke finds the video where like basically the Dharma guy is basically saying like the butt in his bullshit. Yeah. And then like and then Locke like believes it and it's funny, he watches that with Echo and Locke loses all faith upon watching that, but Echo like Echo is like invigorated in the faith. Like Locke is like Locke is like I can't believe the button's bullshit. My life is bullshit and Echo just comes out of it like, no, the lo- the button is more important than mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. At the beginning of season three, Lock Lock's faith is fully restored. Yeah, Lock's faith being the the tragedy of his character. Yeah, Lock, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's in, it's interesting. Yeah, but they were. Yeah, I I can agree with you that the execute it like it's a good idea that they challenged Lock's faith and they had him go through that crisis of faith and they had another character there to juxtapose that with. That's, and that's, that's, we talked about that when we were talking about season one, that that is like a tenant of Lost. Like it's right. always, it's always one idea, one concept, or one person or group versus another. Right. That's, that's kind of what Lost always is. Like it's, it's always one thing versus another, you know, whether it's, you know, that the tailies versus the, you know, the regular people that we were introduced to first, the, um, the, the others versus the, you know, Oceanic flight 815 survivors right the um science versus faith is a huge one you know but here it's portrayed differently like different types of faith for vying against each other right you know? right it's kind of flipped on its head right because it's like yeah it's like now Locke is jack and echo is lock <laughs> <laughs> uh but but yeah that was that was interesting 
And it's all, it, it all comes to the motivations because Locke comes from a place where he always, he needed something grandiose in his life. He needed to be part of something important. And the island gave him that feeling of being part of something important. Whereas Echo was somebody who was lost before. Yeah. He was like, he wasn't like looking to be important. He just was like already completely lost. He was in, in basically what would be considered an irredeemable character. Yeah. He was, you know, yeah. Like, like you assume Echo is a priest right but then they have his flashbacks and they reveal that he was a ruthless drug runner who was you know he was basically taken as as a as a child a young man you know into you know into one of these child armies yeah and he's a murderer a drug runner yeah he's a murderer a drug runner eventually he poses as a priest to run to run these you know this heroin you know which which is a a play which is the plane Boone found Boone and Locke found in the first season that was full of heroin that's connected mm-hmm. to Echo's story we find out you know Echo's brother is actually on that plane you know and we find out that at the end of Echo's story at the season you know season 2 at the end of like his flash flashbacks we find out that Echo you know Echo loses his brother because his brother gets on that plane and that sets Echo on a path of redemption of trying to trying to redeem himself and atone for you know who he who he was Yeah, well, it's like, it's opposite of Locke's path. Like, Echo took a path towards humility, and Locke took a path towards the grandiose, you know? Right. Like, Locke wanted to be important, and Echo wanted to learn humility. Right. And that's where their paths, like, differentiated. So then, like, how they they react to challenges to their faith is very different. Yeah. So yeah, that was that's interesting. You know, I was thinking about while we were talking about this. But that's why I said that's that I what think, that's why I said like that's that's why I said at the top that Echo was the most interesting of the tail section survivors because because yeah. I think he is, he is a fascinating character and I and I love it, the character I love the actor who plays him. It's so good. While we were talking about that, I started thinking one of the things that I really like about season two, and it becomes just a tenant of the series as a whole, and there's a little bit of it in season one, but in season two, it's like major, is the way that Lost like revisits scenes from like different perspectives. Yes. So in this one, like I think one of the first real notable ones where they did it in this, in this season was where they had, uh, the scene where, where like, you know, they meet up with the others and Kate had been taken hostage. Hostage. And then you kind of see this other perspective of like Michael, like with yeah. the others. Yeah, you see, you see it from Michael's see, perspective. Yeah, and you see this whole different thing. And they're using the old footage and the old sound from these old things, and then recutting it, and then keeping time with it to show these two different sides and how how they're interacting, and you're getting like a better understanding of the whole. Right. And it's Lost is really good at that. Like, like still, I don't think any other show is as good at doing that specific trick as Lost was, you know? And it it happens a lot more throughout the show, too. Like, and the way this season ended with the Desmond episode with him, with Desmond, his flashback and realizing that, like, he was the cause of the plane crash and, like, all these different things. Like, there's so much that that does that in that aspect, too, you know? Yeah, there's so much that does that uh, in that aspect. There's a scene where Desmond was, like, at his lowest and he was, like, ready to basically kill himself and then he hears the pounding and you see that that's the moment that where Boone had died and Locke was freaking out over the hatch door. Yes. And crying and beating on it. And he turns on the light and that light renews Locke's faith. Yeah, that one, of the, one of the things is uh, Lost is all about connections. Uh, Lo- Lost subscribes to the philosophy that everything is connected and Lost revels in, in just revealing like surprising ways in which things that you wouldn't imagine would be connected are actually connected. And it goes through the whole series. There's like, there are, there's much more to come, you know, much, Mm -hmm. much more connections between people and events that you would not have guessed. But, and, 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 and again, Lost is so good because they, they don't come across as assholes. I will say right yeah. now, they, they all seem planned or well thought out. I will say now there is, there is one 
one part in the season. It's in Anna Lucia's second flashback in her last episode where Anna Lucia meets up with Jack's father and they actually go to Australia together. You know, he kind of like makes like this agreement with her that she's going to be his bodyguard. Again, that's a surprising connection, right? Anna Lucia and Jack's father like met and they went to Australia together. Uh, yeah, there's but there's even more connections. There's even there's more like because the where they're, they're at the bar. Yeah, well, they're they're yeah yeah they're at the bar and you know they run across Sawyer from it. But there's a one thing I want to point out because Aunt Lucia takes him to this woman's house in Australia and he's banging on the door. You know, she's my daughter. I have every right to see her. She's my daughter. I have every right to see her. We don't know what he's talking about, but when when you find when you find out, and you will find out who he's talking about later on down the road, you will ship bricks. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's lots of the stuff like that. Like I love the part where they come across Sawyer because we already had the scene I think last season where Sawyer yeah, was like at the bar and had an interaction with Jack's dad. So yeah, and then you kind of like seeing like this. It, it, so it's you already got this connection, and then that connection is basically being doubled by. By saying, oh, Anna Lucia was there the whole time as well. Yeah, Anna Lucia. But she was outside the bar. I don't know if she was outside the bar the whole time. I don't know because. Well, maybe not the whole time, but yeah. she was there. Like <laughs> She was when, there. She probably when took. When Sawyer like, stumbled into the bar himself. She was pretty pissed off and, and disillusioned with him at that point, so she probably like left him at that bar. But we find out, yeah, Sawyer was at that bar, and that's where Sawyer and Jack's dad meet from the first season. So, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's like every time it's like, oh, they made a connection here. And then like another even deeper connection like gets like lobbed on top of that. Yeah, the, it's the show. <laughs> the show is so good at this because again, it, it's not bullshit. It's not like, it's not like, uh, you know, like, like, like Henry is turns out to, uh, be like, uh, Walt's babysitter in one episode, you know, which would be mm-hmm. stupid. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's all things that make logical sense. Yeah, there's, there's so much good stuff. There's the was it we got to see in this season. We got to see the psychic that that told Claire yes. she needed to. Yeah, we got to see him again. They got to see him. They connected Claire's story to Echo's story through that psychic, which is another surprising connection. Like, yeah, so yeah. characters, even small characters that you wouldn't think of, reappear in other characters' stories. Yes. Yeah. So it's really good. That's one of the greatest strengths of, of Lost is how they do that. And I think season two did a, a particularly good job of that. Like, it was just constant. There's constant stuff like that going on th- throughout it, you know? Yeah, they really play with that with season two. Uh, there's constant. Yeah, it's constant. Like, uh, like, oh, another one is... Locke is doing, is like a home maintenance guy, you know, and he's doing work for a woman who is Saeed's, uh, you know, the love of Saeed's. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 I I remember that one. Yeah. That was, that was cool. That's such a, like a surprise moment. It's just like little things like that, you know? (laughs) And, and, and of course the U.S. Army general from Saeed's story reappears. As working for the Dharma Initiative, and he he he's the one who recruits Desmond to push the button. And Desmond got to the island on a sailboat that he got from Libby. Yeah, that he got from Libby. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like a posthumous moment too, because it was after her character had already been killed. Yeah, that was that we get this flashback. Her, that we got that flashback. Yeah, we saw Libby. We learned a little bit more about Libby, surprisingly, uh, where she, you know, she said, you know, she mentioned that she had a husband who died of an illness. You know, previously. Yeah. And this, I mean, they never ended up giving us too much about Libby's backstory. We know that she was in a mental hospital with Hurley. Yeah, we know she was in the but hospital with her, Hurley. Presumably this is why. <laughs> that, yeah, presumably that's why. We don't really know. That was kind of inane because, like, they kind of, like, had that scene as, like, a stinger. Like, kind of hinting that, like, ooh, Libby is, like, maybe... Something's may- off about Libby. Maybe she... Yeah, something's off about her. She's, uh, she's lying about being, a, you know, a clinical psychologist you know this is gonna no it's not gonna go anywhere (laughs) yeah 
Like I said, that might very well have had to do with the actress getting a DUI. Right. While she was on the set of that show. And, like, other issues with her that they, they needed to get rid of her. Right. And they just kind of wrapped it up quickly and then brought her back just to kind of do the Desmond thing. The Desmond storyline twist bit. Yeah. You know, I think that's probably for the best that that didn't go anywhere. Because that might have... That, that might have been dumb. Uh, you know? Yeah, some of those... Yeah. It's what you talked about, like, the characters taking these little edgy turns. That was one of those. Yeah, that was one of those. Yeah. That wasn't really all that necessary. You know what? I remember when they were doing the show, I remember, um, Hurley being the, uh, 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 Jorge Garcia, the actor who plays Hurley, doing an interview, I think after season one, where he was talking about, they said, you know, well, where, what do you want from your character or something? And he was talking about how his character is really loved. Like, and he gets like grandmas all the time would come up to him and go, Oh, Hurley, you know, on the street and stuff. And they really, you know, a very lovable character and they really liked him. And he was like, well, like, well, what do you want for your character moving forward? And he's like, Oh, he's, I'd like to have like one of those moments where people go like, oh, I don't know about him, you know, like... Right. <laughs> and, like, it's speaking to that kind of, like, the idea of, like, oh, maybe maybe he's not so nice or something, you know? Right. And that's, I think, was exactly the problem that uh, you had with a lot of the stuff in Season 2 were, were things akin to that. Like, they were like, yeah. oh, you know, like, Libby's this nice character, but oh, I don't know about her, you know? Right, There's something, right. There's something off something about up. her now. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, there's something off about Libby. Yeah, it's like that kind of stuff is probably the worst bits of season two. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. It's like, I, I do like that they, I don't necessarily think they handled it completely right, but I do like that they handled like a little bit of like food addiction for Hurley. Yeah. In the season. I don't necessarily like the way they handled it, but I like that they, ha- that they d- dove into the idea of like anxiety and depression and, and different mental problems that you have and how eating you know i say this as a fat guy myself eating is something that like it gives you a dopamine kick just like doing drugs or smoking cigarettes i give you that dopamine kick that helps you cope Right. With things and, and how eating is like a coping mechanism. And they show some of the things that happened in Hurley's past, like well, the balcony. That yeah, that's what I stuff. was going to say. Like, like they reveal that, you know, Hurley, Hurley is not being overly dramatic. Uh, but, you know, Hurley, Hurley has like a legit, you know, they, they reveal that Hurley was in a mental hospital for a short, for a short period because he had this legit tragedy happen to him that he, he blamed him himself for. You know, he basically mm-hmm. said he was so fat he made the balcony collapse. Even though like the doctor tried pointed out like there were there were already too many people on on the deck that its weight could support. You know, like yeah. like you know, he tried to point out Hurley. It wasn't because Hurley was fat. But Hurley br- blames himself and it's you know, it comes out through like self hatred because, you know, for you know, for, you know, Hurley hit Hurley's negative, uh, you know, personal opinion about himself, you know? Mm-hmm. He takes his negative opinions about his weight and he internalizes it and he blames himself for these people's deaths, you know? And he does exactly what somebody would do in that situation does, which is he continues to eat. Yes. Like overeat, overindulge to the point of like obscenity. And that's exactly what happens. That's why I, I would always tell people you know there's people that would like try to shame people to get them to like lose weight and i'd always tell them in except in rare occasions where like the personality traits match that's not gonna work because if you shame somebody for being overweight what they're gonna do is eat more and it might sound illogical to you but it's because it's it's mental illness it's because it's it's stress and anxiety and they got to be overweight in the first place because they couldn't handle the addiction to the dopamine kick they would get when and they'd eat something that they'd enjoy. Right. And they couldn't handle that, and that's what led them to being overweight in the first place. And now, when they're challenged and they're stressed out, well, what happens if you challenge and stress out a junkie or a gambling addict? They run to their vice. Right. To and escape. And in the case of somebody being overweight, their vice is eating. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you challenge somebody who's overweight and make them feel like shit about themselves, they're, they're not gonna go oh, this is the point that I'll turn things around. They're going to go, oh, I need food to feel better. And that's why, and that's why I like the, the Libby, 
uh, Hurley relationship, you know. I mm-hmm. thought, I thought that was good because, uh, cause Libby was, was able to help Hurley through some of these issues. So it's, it's a shame, like, they killed her character off, like, when they did. Cause yeah. now I feel like. It's a shame, but like you said, it's also at the same time. It's almost. Yeah. If they yeah. were going to try to go like a mysterious yeah, route, it might yeah, not the, have been the good. direction they were looking like they were heading was, was stupid. So. <laughs> was unnecessary. <laughs> uh, yeah. I would say. But it would have been cool to get more of what we saw, like in the Desmond flashback. Like that part of Libby would have been cool to see more of. Right. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Um. Hmm. I mean, I guess that's pretty much it. We did a really long conversation on season one, but a lot of that was just talking about the setup of Lost in general. Right. See, so, and, so yeah, so we didn't get too into the mysteries. We, we met one of the others. Like, we met a few of them, but we go really in depth into one of them. But we don't really get to meet the others in this season. Again, it's more of a tease. Next season, mm-hmm. we really get to meet the others. So yeah. that's something to look forward to moving ahead. Yeah, we get we get a, a big, big, much stronger focus on the others in season three. Desmond becomes that's a, actually kind of to its its detriment in the early part of season three. There's some of the stuff with the others is a bit like yeah, well, forced, well, yeah, <laughs> and and slow in the same way season two was. And you know? it's also frustratingly uh, lacking any real explanations for anything. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. They were they were definitely treading water in the first. The first, like, half of season it's three, weird or because more than half, we're spe- I think. So far, four episodes in, we're spending so much time with the others at, you know, where they're situated and located. You know, we have, like, multiple scenes of Jack, Kate, and Sawyer interacting with Henry and other people, and they're just not confronting them about what they did or asking obvious questions. So, yeah. so we're not. And that's 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 treading water. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. There's something that happens though that that isn't related to like on the show, but like behind the scenes during season three, Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse negotiated an endpoint for the series. Yes. And they did this during the first as the first half of season three was airing, hmm. and then they had this really weird hiatus. And I know a lot of people quit after the season three mid-season hiatus it, it kind of had like a really dumb cliffhanger oh, okay like a, like a really kind of stupid cliffhanger thing and i know a lot of people got turned off by it and were like i'm out but that was like the height of them treading water and then when the show came back on the air to finish off the season it was like way better and they like they just went like full steam ahead and and everything started moving the oh, way yeah. It should oh yeah move. that's that that's when they introduce they do new things with the flashbacks mm-hmm. yeah that's that's when the show gets really inventive yeah and then that leads into season four which was a strike season a writer yeah. strike season and yet still one of the best seasons so, uh, it has like season four has like the literal best episode of lost ever yeah uh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some really interesting ideas come into play too. It, it's it's a fascinating season. Yeah, but it it, it like, really like the episode I think like blew me away because it's it's something that you never see coming. It, it I will just say like it, it it is a very unique twist on the flashbacks mm-hmm. that that really like blows your mind. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few good. Like, I, I made a comment when the season finale of season two, which was really good, was all Desmond focused. Yes. Both parts of the two part episode. And I made a comment there that, like, Desmond has some of the best episodes in the series. Yeah, Desmond has some of the Desmond-centric best. Desmond-centric episodes are stunning, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what made, like, Desmond one of my favorite all-time lost characters, you know? Because, yeah, he has some of the best episodes, and he's just a charming, likable character on top of it. But, you yes. know, but, but yeah. Yeah, they do interesting things with his character, and oh yeah, definitely. It's to the point where, like, Desmond may not have been one of the original characters since the beginning of the show, but you can't have Lost without him. Exactly, yep. So let's let's call it an end point for now, for Lost. Yes. Next week, we're going to be talking about the Magicians. We've missed three episodes uh, because not only did we have this week where we were talking about Lost instead, but last week we took off. So we have those two plus the next episode next week. So we're going to be discussing three episodes of the Magicians, catching up on that next week. 
But until then, here's what's coming up in the week ahead. So today, as we're recording this, it's Monday, March 16th. Uh, Roswell, New Mexico, where it's returned to the CW. My Brilliant Friend, the story of a new name, has come to HBO. This is the second season of My Brilliant Friend, which each season has its own sub-name. But then also coming to HBO today, as we're recording this, is The Plot Against America, which I am so psyched for. I cannot wait to watch that show. It's taping right now. I'm, I'm going to head downstairs and probably watch it right away. Oh. Awesome. Yeah, this is the next show from uh, Michael Simon, who did The Wire. Yeah, it looks really good. I can't wait. Wednesday, March 18th, Brockmire returns to IFC. Motherland Fort Salem starts on Freeform. That looks surprisingly good and unfreeform-like. <laughs> and Little Fires Everywhere miniseries comes to Hulu. On Thursday, March 19th, Ruthless comes to BET+. Feel Good comes to Netflix. And Altered Carbon Resleeved comes to Netflix. This is a Altered Carbon animated special that, you know, it's like a side story to Altered Carbon. Sure. On Friday, March 20th, Self-Made, Inspired by the Life of Madam C.J. Walker comes to Netflix. On Monday, March 23rd, uh, Freud comes to Netflix. On Tuesday, March 24th, One Day at a Time comes to Pop. This was originally a Netflix show, so this is weird because there was a period early in Netflix's original content where they were, like, picking up all these shows that were, like, canceled. And people were like, oh, like, everybody was like, what show should Netflix pick up next? It was almost like a meme. Like, oh, this show's getting canceled. Should Netflix pick it up? I mean, we were saying that with Hannibal <laughs> when Hannibal got canceled. Can Netflix pick up Hannibal? You know, like, uh huh. But this is like the opposite. Netflix canceled one day at a time and it got picked up by a cable channel. Right. So this is like the kind of the reverse of that, which is interesting. It's, it just shows like the changing face of the whole industry, you know? Yeah. That it's not like the expectation is no longer on Netflix. And now like other people that have trouble acquiring good content are like, hey, this Netflix show is popular. We'll continue it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Also on that same day, Council of Dads comes to NBC. Um, on Thursday, March 26th, Tacoma FD returns to True TV. That's a really funny show from the makers of, uh, um, what's that movie called? The, uh, um, Super Troopers. Oh, okay. Oh, right. So right. In the creators of Super Troopers, it's, it's the same act, the, the same lead actors and stuff. So if you liked that, you'll like Tacoma FD pretty much. Sure. Seven Seeds the anime series returns to Netflix and an Orthodox comes to Netflix. On Friday, March 27th, Vagrant Queen comes to sci-fi. This is sci-fi basically returning to like hard sci-fi, like Babylon 5 style sci-fi. Weird alien creature types and stuff like that, you know? Adventures in outer space. It's interesting sci-fi the way they the way they handle content. They'll they'll like focus on stuff like this, and then they go like, oh, we're just gonna focus on more naturalistic sci-fi, like more normal stuff for a while, and then they do that and don't do anything like space-based or really like off the wall. And then like everyone gets like sick of that, so then they go back to doing <laughs> the high concept sci-fi stuff again. So mm -hmm. now they're canceling the magicians, basically the last reason to really watch anything on sci-fi. And so Vagrant Queen looks like their attempt to go like, hey, oh, we're, we're, we can still do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Come back. Come back. Please. Please come back. Until they inevitably, inevitably betray that fan base again. <laughs> Pretty much. Also on that day, Baghdad Central comes to Hulu. Ozark returns for its third season on Netflix. And Il Processo comes to Netflix. Then on Sunday, March 29th, Beef House and Three Busy Debras both come to Adult Swim. Call the Midwife returns on PBS. On Monday, March 30th, Almost Paradise comes to WGN, which for some reason is still putting out original content after saying they weren't doing original content anymore. Right. <laughs> These weird little cable channels that, you know. <laughs> These stupid little cable channels. As I mentioned, next week, we're back to the magicians for a triple episode. So look forward to that. Until then, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Tyson Gifford. Will is at Voxel Hero. You can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, as well as our site, thedoublescreen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast client like iTunes or Pocket Cast. And the entire backlog of our podcast is available on our YouTube channel. So thank you, everybody, for listening. See you in another life, brother. Yeah, later. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to reach out to us and make a comment, send an email to contact at thetotalscreen.com. Stay tuned to The Total Screen for the very best 